Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here today for the Gazette's Iowa Ideas in Depth the Week on Higher Education. I'm Vanessa Miller. I've been a reporter with the Gazette since 2011. I've been covering higher education since 2013. Um, and we just wanna to start today by thanking our sponsor, Kirkwood Community College. I think we have a short video to share. Hello, I'm Dr. Lori Sundberg. I'm president of Kirkwood Community College, and I'd like to welcome you to the Iowa Ideas in-depth look at higher education this week. Kirkwood is proud to be a sponsor of this event. Kirkwood has been serving this region for 50 years, and I know that we're gonna be serving for 50 more years. So as you think about your higher education needs or even continuing education needs, I hope that you'll think of Kirkwood. Again, welcome to the event, and I hope you enjoy the presentations. Awesome. Um, well, so just diving in, I want to express how thankful we are to have Mary Sue Coleman here today to get us started with some thoughts on the state of higher education, both nationally and locally. President Coleman served as University of Iowa president from 1995 to 2002. Uh, she went on to serve as University of Michigan president from 2002 to 2014, and then as president of the Association of American Universities from 2016 until last year year. She served on numerous boards and councils over the years and in 2009 she was named one of Time Magazine's 10 Best American University Presidents for her focus on research and for her success in fundraising. So her broad background across academia and her range of roles over the years gives her a vastly well-informed vantage point to assess the current state of higher education and again we could not be more grateful for her willingness to share some of her thoughts with us today. Um, after President Coleman's remarks, we're going to take questions from the audience. So anyone with a question uh, can type it into the chat and those will come to me to ask. So yeah, let's get started. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Vanessa and the Gazette for hosting this program uh, and the program for the entire week. I also want to commend the Gazette for having a higher education reporter. That's becoming more and more of a rarity in the news media. And I'm pleased that the Gazette places a value on covering such a critical segment of the community. I'm honored to open this year's Iowa Ideas program because Iowa is very important to me and it's very important to the country. I wish we could all be together in the same room, but I'm pleased people want to gather remotely to talk about higher education. When I was 12 years old, my family moved from Georgia to Cedar Falls. My parents wanted my sisters and me to have the best education possible, and Iowa provided excellent opportunities. My father taught at what was then called Iowa State Teachers College, and my mother was a public school teacher. After high school, I attended Grinnell College, where in my sophomore year, I met Cedar Rapids native and Washington High graduate by the name of Kenneth Coleman. Nearly 60 years have passed and we are still together. When I left Iowa in 1965, it was as a college graduate. When I returned 30 years later, it was to become president of the University of Iowa. It was my first college presidency and an unforgettable experience. It prepared me well for future leadership at the University of Michigan and at the Association of American Universities. The University of Iowa also provided me with lifelong friends. I've had the opportunity to remain connected with Iowa as a director for the Meredith Corporation and a trustee of my alma mater, Grinnell College. So I have deep, deep affection for the state its legacy of exceptional public education and its forward thinking. I wanna spend some time this afternoon discussing the state of higher education in 2021 and what lies ahead as we emerge from this pandemic. I know there will be deeper discussions throughout the week. So today I'll offer an overview of how I see the landscape and I look forward to your questions. 
I spent my entire year in higher, my entire career in higher education. I've been a faculty member, a dean, a provost, and a president. Despite all these experiences, including leading the University of Michigan during the Great Recession, there has been no scenario like the one I've seen facing higher education during COVID. There have been countless ramifications of the pandemic on our colleges and universities. We've seen lost revenue in terms of tuition, housing, dining, and athletics. Both academic and non-academic departments have been forced to lay off faculty and staff and eliminate some positions. Employees have seen benefits either eliminated or curtailed, including contributions to their retirement programs. Universities with health systems like UI have seen their clinics and emergency rooms overstretched by the pandemic while having to delay other healthcare services and incurring financial losses in doing so. We've seen strained relations between universities and their host communities because of off-campus students who don't follow safety protocols. Most significantly, as in every segment of society, lives have been permanently lost or altered. For so many, this has been the most difficult year of our lives. I know we're all grateful and relieved that we now have safe, effective vaccines to combat this disease. We see the light at the end of a long dark, dark tunnel, but we must remain vigilant. There's still a lot of uncertainty about the future and how it will look. I wanna call out what I believe are three of the most pressing problems facing higher education as we straddle this period between COVID and recovery. And I also want to share some of the silver linings we see as the pandemic clouds lift. If there's one constant about higher education, it is that we focus on the future. So I also have some thoughts about post-pandemic campus. Let's begin with the challenges. The financial picture for our colleges and universities is still coming into focus. But we know that as with so many sectors of the economy, the pandemic has been pretty brutal. Higher education has absorbed at least $120 million billion in new expenses and lost revenue. Revenues are down because of declines in enrollment, which translates into fewer tuition dollars that support the academic enterprise and a decrease in fees that go toward auxiliary services such as campus housing and dining. Overall, our institutions have seen their revenues drop by about 14%. It varies from state to state, of course, particularly for public universities. The University of Iowa, Iowa State, and UNI have collectively lost $185.6 million since last March. Iowa's 15 community colleges say the pandemic's financial impact carries a price tag of $21 million. These are not just numbers. They're people's livelihoods and students' futures. A key source for funding public universities is state support. The good news is that overall state support for public universities has remained steady thanks to federal relief dollars that came through the CARES Act. Still, half the states are reporting a drop in funding for universities and colleges this fiscal year. And overall state support for higher education has been on a downward spiral for decades. But the forecast for state aid is not as dire as it was in the early months of the pandemic. The most significant source of funding is of course tuition and tuition revenue is down because of declining enrollments. Students have elected not to attend because they do not want to learn remotely or the pandemic has hurt their family's finances or they simply wanna wait out the pandemic to see what happens. Declines in enrollment hurt financially. More importantly, 
they hurt our colleges and universities because of the loss of talent coming through our doors. And this is what I see as the second critical challenge facing our universities, the loss of human talent. Overall, nationwide undergraduate enrollment is down 3.6% since the pandemic began. That translates to more than a half a million young people deferring or ending their college plans. At community colleges, which are often a lifeline for lower income students, enrollment is down 9.5%. In particular, we're seeing fewer freshmen and fewer black and Latino students enroll. In terms of global students, enrollments of new international students dropped by a staggering 43%. We cannot blame the pandemic and the inability to travel entirely for the decline in international enrollments. Students in other countries have been reluctant to attend American universities because of the political climate. Rioting at our nation's capital and anti-immigrant rallies do not make for strong recruitment videos and international students are turning elsewhere for their advanced degrees. Canadian and Australian universities are now looking more attractive. I applaud President Biden for ending the so-called Muslim ban on immigration from certain nations and for strengthening DACA and giving dreamers hope for their futures in this country. Our doors are open to these students. Declines in enrollment hurt the intellectual diversity of our campuses. One of the most rewarding aspects of the college experience is that students are exposed to new people, different ideas and other cultures. When enrollments decline, when we see fewer students who are German or Latino or Vietnamese or African-American, it is a loss for everyone. We've also lost talent and experience through layoffs and hiring freezes in higher education. An estimated 650,000 jobs have disappeared. That's 13% of the higher education workforce. It ranges from employees who work in student housing and campus dining to scholars who have seen their departments shrink or close. We're seeing a reduction in graduate programs particularly in the arts and humanities. More than 130 doctoral programs in the humanities and social sciences say that they will not be admitting new students for the fall. This pause creates a freeze in the talent pipeline, which does not bode well for the future of scholarship and teaching in certain fields. Let me pause with the bad news. I realize almost every sector of society is hurting. There have been some silver linings with all the pandemic storm clouds. These are bright spots and we must leverage them for the better. First and foremost, we have seen the absolute need for science. The expertise of scientists has helped to explain and track this virus and develop guidelines for containing its spread. And aside from the space race, which undoubtedly shaped my view of how science could change the world, the, the demand placed on researchers to find a coronavirus vaccine is unlike anything I have ever seen. And that scientists have developed not one, but several safe and effective vaccines within a year is nothing short of miraculous. Not one, but three Vaccines have been created, tested, and manufactured in the US within a year. Think of how long people suffered from polio and smallpox before there were vaccin vaccines. And then reflect on the rapidity and efficacy of these COVID vaccines. It's an extraordinary testament to the power of good science. This endorsement of science goes beyond developing the vaccine. Our health systems are testing 
and delivering the vaccine. My husband and I live in Denver, where the University of Colorado Health System teamed up with the Rockies baseball team, the city, the county, to create a mass vaccination site in the parking lots of Coors Field. It was unbelievably efficient, and I got my vaccine there. Our physicians and researchers are also working to understand this virus and its variants better. They're tracking its spread and they are developing therapies for patients dealing with damage to their hearts, lungs, and senses of smell and taste. Science has been under attack needlessly in recent years. I'm sorry that it's taken a global pandemic to validate the importance of good science. But I'm proud of the research community and the many critical contributions it made this past year. There's another lesson that we've learned from COVID. And it's ironic that I'll share it in a Zoom talk. College students don't like remote learning and their professors don't like remote teaching. They want personal contact as we all do in our lives. They want the intensity of a classroom discussion or the engagement that comes with office hours. They wanna connect at coffee shops and in libraries and laboratories. Remote learning can and does work well for delivering information in large lecture classes. As we open our campuses this fall, many universities will continue to offer these large classes in, on, in an online format. This will help as we continue to manage large gatherings and work to avoid any surges of infection cases. But both faculty and students want the rewards of an in-person experience. One survey of professors who were teaching remotely found that nearly 80% said they found it challenging to create any sense of engagement with their students. That's not what we want from our classroom experiences. So we can expect a hybrid approach to pedagogy with a mix of online and in-person teaching, which leads me to another benefit of the pandemic. And that is how we've been forced to examine how we use space and our facilities on campus it's possible that we will need less classroom space, particularly large lecture halls, if we continue with delivering large introductory courses in an online format. Students haven't been the only ones working remotely. With so many of our employees working from home, we see opportunities to rethink office space and encourage flexible work schedules. Staff who work in business and finance or other facets of administration may not need to be on campus five days a week. Instead, they might alternate working from home and sharing office space. In addition to giving employees more op options about their work-life balance, having fewer people on campus may help reduce a university's utility costs and ease campus parking demands. As a former university president, I can tell you there is never <clears throat> enough parking. It's been one year since our campus is shut down along with everything else in the world. It's been difficult and frustrating. There's been real loss in so many ways, but I'm an optimist and I'm feeling hopeful about what awaits us as our colleges and universities roll out their plans for reopening this fall. We are learning as we go, and I have no illusions that we will ever go back to the so-called normal. But here are a few thoughts as we move forward. I mentioned the impact of civil unrest on international enrollment. The ramifications go far beyond international students and how they see our country. We need to look at ourselves. I believe our inability or unwillingness as a nation to confront racism is a significant challenge that higher education must continue to address. Our campuses may be largely empty now, but racism and inequity 
have not gone away. When students return in the fall, I guarantee this will be a significant concern. Black lives will still matter. Diversity and equity will still matter. And creating inclusive, welcoming environments will always matter. Right now, 60% of our top 100 public universities are enrolling fewer black students than 20 years ago. We must do better. We are crippling ourselves as a society if we do not embrace and promote all of our citizens' potential. After the killing of George Floyd last summer, many universities publicly pledged to look inward and make changes to create more welcoming campuses. And then because of COVID, most campuses remain closed in the fall. It's difficult to be remote and inclusive. Now, as we move forward to reopening, we must collectively uphold these pledges to improve and be more inclusive. And we must listen to our students. I am currently a trustee of the University of Denver, a medium-sized private institution in the city where we now reside. Last month, during a Zoom trustee meeting, we heard from the leaders of 13 student groups serving a variety of underrepresented minority students. They explained to us that while they were excited and grateful to be students, they often felt unwelcome by some of their peers and misunderstood by many faculty members. Their pleas to the board were a wake up call for every single one of my trustee colleagues. Listening to our students also means paying attention to their mental health. The pandemic has been an isolating time for all of us. It has been particularly hard for those with mental illnesses such as depression, but all students have been affected by the closing of campuses. They're feeling anxiety, stress, and sadness. They're seeing their parents struggle financially. They've lost relatives to the virus and they are separated from their friends. Almost 75% of students in one survey reported that their mental health had worsened during the pandemic. The good news is that they, that the majority said they knew where to turn for help. We must ensure our campuses provide resources for the well being of our students, particularly as they make the transition back to campus and to more social interactions. We are all beginning to transition to the new normal that awaits us. It's both exciting and a bit uncomfortable because we don't know what to expect entirely. I know I'm eager to hug my grandchildren, and there will be a lot of hugging this fall as friends and coworkers unite on campuses across the country. Higher education is critical to our prosperity and prominence as a country, as communities and as a country. We must reinvest in our colleges and universities as places that provide cures, treatments, and opportunities. I'm so encouraged that Iowans like you are engaged in a week of sharing ideas about all the higher education institutions focused on tomorrow. Because tomorrow is why we exist. Higher education is society's way of saying it believes in a better future. It is a future that undoubtedly will bring another pandemic, but we can be better prepared. It is a future that will demand greater expertise. But by drawing on the potential of all students and scholars, we can deliver answers. And it is a future that promises educated, engaged graduates to lift up and advance our communities. Thank you for your interest today. I look forward to the discussion.
Yes, thank you so much, uh, President Coleman, for sharing those thoughts. I'm sure they all ring true for many of the people listening in, whether they have been teaching remotely or learning remotely or struggling with mental health issues. I just uh, think it, it really is relevant to everybody's experience these days. Um, I just want to remind folks uh, that if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen, and then those will come to me and I will ask them of President Coleman. Um, but I just wanted to, to start with a few questions that I have here. So in addition to all of these issues that COVID brought up for higher education, it was facing so many issues kind of before the pandemic hit, including um, this enrollment cliff that folks have talked about or in Iowa sort of shifting demographics. Um, one of the issues that Iowa has been facing is this idea of brain drain and that sort of Iowa exports so many of its educated people because of lack of employment opportunities here. So I'm just wondering if you could talk about that and about ways um, that Iowa might be able to look at reversing that. Sure, you know, well, you know, I, I would really hope that uh, the legislature in Iowa would focus its attention on how to create a better business environment for the state. I mean, there are things the state could do. I think particularly as funding is coming from the Recovery Act, uh, the big program that President Biden has, that, that funding will be available to the state, how the state uses that funding, if it could do it to, uh, to create an opportunity for businesses to want to locate in Iowa. I mean, there's a whole range of things to do. The other issue though for Iowa, I understand the problem of created an educated populace and many of the young people having to leave. But I also think Iowa could have a program to bring people back uh, when they want to settle down and have families. Uh, they may go away to the coasts uh, for, for the excitement right after college or for graduate school or whatever, but then recruiting them back to help the state prosper, I think is a very good strategy for the state. In short, you know, Having an educated populace, I think, ensures democracy. It's important for the state. It's been important for Iowa uh, for decades, and I hope that that remains. Yeah, great. Um, and we, we do have a couple questions kind of along that line um, regarding state support. So one person is wondering whether colleges and universities should be allocated additional resources from, uh, to support students with their mental health. I don't know if that's if they mean from the state or or where that money should come from, but should that be, I guess, a financial priority both for the colleges and from from the state perspective? You know, as we emerge from the pandemic, I think paying attention to the mental health of students is going to be more important than ever. It, it's always been important, and and one of the things that I've observed over my fifty year career uh, in higher education is that as universities open themselves up to more students, I mean, if you, if you think about back in the 40s and 50s, higher education was really available only to those who were wealthy. Um, and, and the opening up after World War II has been a marvelous thing for our society because it generated an economic boon the likes of which the world had never seen. Um, as we opened up our doors though, we opened them up to students who might have mental health challenges. But that's a positive in my view, because we're giving people an opportunity to have robust careers, to do important things with their lives. And yes, we need to pay attention and provide services for students that need them. I mean, one of the things that encouraged me so much about these surveys of students and their mental health issues because of the pandemic is the fact that they knew where to go for help. And what that said to me is campuses have started to provide that help in a way that is very help, you know, very good for our students. So I'm encouraged by it. Great, yeah. And the next question is a really good one too, and one that I'm super interested in. But regarding all of the the losses that the campuses have had in terms of students and new people, new cultures, new ideas, how do you think that campus leaders should re-engage students who are returning? Um, I guess that's the first part of the question. 
Sure. You, you know, I, it is going, I said we're a little bit in unknown territory um, because, you know, even when you think about what campuses went through as part of the Great Recession, you know, 2008, 2009, the challenges that we face today dwarf what we had to do back in that time. Um, so we're going to be doing it gingerly. I think that university presidents, and I know they're doing this, getting together with their campus teams, deciding how they're going to reintroduce students. They surely will have a hybrid model, some online, some uh, in person. Uh, they're going to have to be careful about implementing public health protocols because certainly what they don't want to see is a rise in infections. Now, what I'm really hopeful about is that this flood of vaccines that are now coming to the country that will have enough vaccine for everybody who wants a vaccine by this summer. Some, some universities are beginning to mandate that students be vaccinated before they come back. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that that is going to be a universal approach, uh, but they can certainly encourage that it happen. Um, and so we'll see, I, 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 it's hard for me to predict you know, how this is going to go. And I think there's no one size fits all. Each, each campus and each campus leader will have to figure out how they're gonna reintroduce students and faculty and staff, because I think a lot of people are gonna be nervous about coming back to campus. But, you know, I, we have so many good ideas in this country that I'm pretty confident that we're gonna do it and do it well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it really will be so fascinating to see how everybody does it and if they do it differently or the same. Um, one question I have is whether you think, so all these students who have left or who were planning to come, you know, last fall and decided to take an unexpected gap year or maybe even did this semester after not experiencing fall like they wanted to. I mean, how do you think campuses are going to try to bring those students back after they've left? I mean, I, I feel like this is kind of a unique sort of recruiting retention uh, territory. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you're exactly right. Um, I, you know, this is going to be a challenge. And again, it, it will probably depend on the location of the campus, but I can see, um, you know, universities holding and colleges holding sort of Saturday sessions <laughs> to introduce students back to campus. Um, I think reaching out uh, to the degree they can kind of in a personalized fashion. I mean, one of the things that's so good about the technology that we have today is that uh, universities at pretty low cost can um, send out letters that are personalized to individual students saying, you know, uh, come on back. Uh, we have a program for you. We have a plan for you to get uh, reintroduced to the university and continue your studies. I certainly hope that these efforts are successful because I think one of the great tragedies of this pandemic would be if students don't have an opportunity uh, to learn and to give, be given options in life. I mean, I think one of the greatest things about higher education is that it gives young people options in their lives, what they can do with their careers. Uh, to be well-educated um, is really going to be important. It is important now. It's gonna be more important in many of the careers that we're seeing in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in one question I've had for a while, and one of the tools that many students and families use, obviously, in shopping for colleges are these rankings. The U.S. News and World Report is mm -hmm. the main one I think many people look at. Um, and, and they actually have rankings. I think new graduate school rankings coming up tomorrow. They're scheduled to. So I just wondered if you could talk at all about the value of those rankings, how relevant they actually are to, this, to the student experience and and yeah, whether they should be, I guess, too, is a question I have. Whether <laughs> students should be using them like they do or whether they even care that much, I don't know. You, you know, I think that's debatable. I, I know a lot of families uh, go to U.S. News or other ranking systems, and I guess there is this just an exorable desire to rank things in our society. Uh, but actually, you know, ranking higher education institutions, one, two, three, four, five, it's sort of a fruitless task um, because 
it depends so much. I mean, U.S. News has tried to tr change its approach. For many years, one of the criteria they used for excellence was how many students got rejected at the institution. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, how many applications they had, how many they accepted. And, and, you know, I and others had talked to them for years about changing the input measure. What is the output measure? What is the success of graduates from your institution and what do they go on and do? So U.S. News has gotten better and they have a way for you to go in and adjust the parameters that you care about. And clearly when families are looking for higher education, uh, they're going to be looking for excellence. There are a lot of excellent institutions in this country. I mean, when you look at the spectrum of the, you know, more than 4,000 higher education institutions, uh, we are world class because we have invested in our public and private institutions. And so the idea that there are 10 that are better than all the rest is just nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, what families should do is to look at what their son and daughters are interested in. The students should do the same things. Uh, what is the institution that you're interested in or the group of institutions that you're interested in? Are they good in those areas? You need to do a lot of investigation and uh, relying on any single ranking system, you know, I, I just think is not the way to go. Uh, it depends on whether you want a small institution, a big institution, do you want an urban location? Do you want a rural location? The miracle of higher education in this country is that there is a good institution for every single student. And uh, I encourage uh, that kind of investigation when you're thinking about where you're gonna spend the next four years of your life or you know, for graduate education too. Right, right. And I think, I think though, just kind of jumping off of that idea though, that some people think that there are like 10 institutions that really, really are these elite ones. Um, this this recruiting scandal, you know, an application scandal that erupted and is now a you know a Netflix <laughs> documentary yeah. slash movie with Operation Varsity Blues. I wonder, could you talk about your thoughts on all of that and and what its implications are going forward? Well, it was shameful. I mean, it was a shameful uh, period of our history as a country, and I know that the institutions implicated because of bad actors. Uh, you know, I guess the coaches and whatever, uh, you know, selling slots to institutions, you know, th th this is just, well, it's criminal. And, and uh, many of the people involved are spending time in jail. And uh, I applaud the, the judicial system for making that happen. You know, this is not the way that we function in the United States. And uh, I hope that's an object lesson for a lot of people, um, you know, and, and the idea, I mean, this is the thing at the core of this scandal that was really so sad. And that that is these parents and these students thought that there was only one institution that, that they should go to. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Um, when you think about, you know, the great institutions, the great research universities, the 63 that are in the Association of American Universities and the University of Iowa and Iowa State are among the members mm -hmm. of the of American universities, they are excellent in what they do uh, because they're research intensive. But there are a lot of institutions that are not so research intensive. They're private colleges, small colleges that are excellent. And so the idea that you have to pay your way into something because of your, your thoughts about prestige is antithetical to what we are as a country. And I'm, I'm glad and I hope it never happens again. I'm glad it was stopped and I hope it never happens again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you're just, you're, you're speaking just now, reminded me of something that I hear so often about Iowa. And I wondered if you could just uh, speak to it briefly. Um, when the university presidents are kind of, you know, boasting about the universities that we have in this state, they mentioned that for its size, it's it's somewhat remarkable to have two research universities, you know, that are AAU members. I mean, is that an accurate portrayal of, of what Iowa has here and what we should be protecting? It is. And actually, it was one of the things that I marveled about when I was uh, named president of the University of Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> back in 1995. I mean, I, I just said, listen, do you realize what you have here in Iowa? You have two institutions, you know, they are of a particular type. They are 
research intensive universities. In addition to that, we have you and I, Mm-hmm. Tremendously, it is so well regarded in teacher education. It's where my father taught for 25 years. I know it well. We have excellent private colleges. Um, I went to Grinnell, one of the best private liberal arts colleges in the country. We have a tremendous community, you know, a community college system in Iowa supported by local communities that provide a pathway and a gateway for so many people. So, yes. <laughs> It, you know, I, I think it's uh, something that, well, as I said, drew us to Iowa as a family when I was very young. Uh, and I think it's one of the greatest, uh, greatest things that Iowa as a state has. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. That's, yeah, and obviously you have a really uh, unique vantage point to be able to, to speak to that. Um, jumping or switching gears just a little bit, this has been an interesting legislative session. Obviously, um, there's been a lot of discussion around higher education, proposed uh, measures that would do things like take away tenure or take away the option of offering tenure. Uh, there was one bill obviously proposing that employees report their political affiliation. Um, there have been bills that would have restricted the university's ability to spend non-state money without legislative approval. There's been bills uh, proposing that every um, amount, every sort of bit of syllabus information is made public online. So just a lot of um, of sort of government oversight discussion regarding the public higher education. And I'm wondering if you could speak to to any of that and and what what you think legislators should be discussing. You know, well, it's very sad to me um, and it doesn't represent the the Iowa that I remember at all. this notion, these bills, they're designed to drive the best and the brightest people away from Iowa, drive away the best faculty, Mm -hmm. drive away the best staff, Mm -hmm. drive away even the best candidates for university presidents. If uh, if this is what the legislature really believes, uh, shame on them, I'm sorry, Uh, Mm -hmm. it, it is not It is not going to create a single job. It's not gonna create economic prosperity. It's not going to make this state the envy of states in this country. Um, There are many things the legislature could do to help uh, reinvest in the universities, to help the universities do what they do the best. Uh, You know, I remember when I was president of Iowa, I was so proud that Iowa won the competition the University of Iowa won the competition for the National Driving Simulator. You may forget about that. That was a big issue back in the late 1990s. And you know what I was so proud about is that we won it from the University of Michigan. We did a better job of putting in the kind of proposal that caused millions of dollars to come into the University of Iowa. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, when I went to Michigan, I felt differently about it. <laughs> Because uh, Iowa had it and Michigan didn't. But, but the point is that you do not create a place that people want to come to and thrive and create business when you, uh, when you demonize higher education. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people agree with you on that. But I, one of the, of the big issues driving all of those bills, I think, is this debate over free speech and First Amendment rights on campuses, which I think is a a pretty difficult um, thing to balance in such a polarized, you know, uh, environment. So I guess I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the importance of maintaining some of those free speech issues or First Amendment issues or discussing those, how the campuses should handle them. You know, free speech is a hallmark of this country. You know, it's embedded. (laughs) And our constitution, of course, I believe in free speech. Um, you know, I, I, I used to say at uh, the University of Michigan, um, when, you know, there were a few controversies about free speech. Uh, and I used to say that I don't have to like what anybody is saying. Uh, the best antidote to speech that you don't like is more speech and speech that opposes uh, one point of view. I mean, we should have robust discussion in this country. uh, And I think it's extremely important uh, that we do that. And uh, 
You know, it's not always going to be comfortable. Uh, it, it, there will be uncomfortable parts of it. And, 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 and I will say, you know, that free speech is not completely unfettered. Uh, you can't be in a crowded place and scream fire. I mean, there are parts of free speech that impinge on public safety uh, that are you need to be careful about. So, so it, it's an important concept. It's one that uh, that we need to preserve. I mean, one of the things I've always felt about higher education and university campuses <clears throat> is a place where where we do promote free speech uh, and we want to do it carefully and correctly. Uh, and, you know, all points of view can be expressed, uh, you know, in a, you know, in a way that we would all appreciate. So, uh, so yes, this is an important con concept. It's sometimes messy, uh, but it's one that we should continue to promote. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, and I, we have a question uh, here that I'm just going to read it directly. It says higher education costs too much. Is it really necessary to provide all of these amenities, fancy dining, climbing walls, etc. Um, and then this, this commenter mentions like European universities don't necessarily provide those things. Sure. Um, so I think if you look at the difference between uh, European universities uh, and US, um, you will certainly find differences, large class sizes at European universities in general, uh, and uh, not the attention to the sort of the well-rounded student and the development of those students as we do in the U.S. Uh, students come to higher education um, in the U.S. sort of in a different point in their lives than most other places in the world. They, uh, high schools uh, generally don't prepare students directly to go into the workforce as most of the rest of the world does. Um, so what we provide and particularly in the on-campus experience that we have online too that seems to work well for more adult learners is ways to develop and experience uh, life uh, in a way that students find extremely attractive. And I think professors find extremely attractive in working with students. So uh, I don't view the things that we provide students, I certainly didn't view it at Iowa or at Michigan uh, as frivolous amenities. I thought they were extremely important. Learning that takes place in residence hall environments is critical. And I paid a lot of attention to that at both places. Learning that takes place because students can engage in activities. And when they come to college, they might have one idea about what they want their major to be, but because they're able to sample a lot of things before they get to declaring the major, they may change careers entirely, uh, much to the benefit of themselves. The other thing that I think many people don't understand about universities like the Iowa State, the University of Iowa, and the University of Northern Iowa is the sort of myriad of things that happen on campus that have nothing to do with undergraduate students. Mm -hmm. Graduate education, laboratory, intense laboratory work, research that is developing these new careers, they don't happen in pharmaceutical companies. They, kept, they happen in universities. And it's because universities can take risks with uh, basic research that don't have to develop into a product. That's why a lot of the federal research money goes to universities and not to pharmaceutical companies because the universities can take risks. So this is a, you know, it, 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 is, it is just, this is a treasure uh, for, for, for our country to have these kind of universities. So what about the cost aspect? Let's get to those because I know people are concerned about the cost. One of the things that our great public universities have done is to create very high quality education at very low relative cost. The other thing that I've been able to see over my 50 year career is the enormous growth in financial aid that's available. A combination, grants, work study, loans at low interest. And one of the things I know that the administration is working on is providing more accessibility and more low cost loans and perhaps even free community college education. 
These are tremendous benefits for our society. And these are things that we should continue to try to promote because an educated citizenry is going to be, make our country even more prosperous in the future. Yeah, you're right. And affordability is a huge question, especially as the demographics change and, it is. and their low income. Yeah, more low income people wanting to pursue higher ed. Um, I did want to ask you about athletics. Um, some obviously, this was a really challenging year for athletics across the board mm -hmm. with so much being canceled. And at the University of Iowa, obviously, we've seen we've seen severe budget cuts that they are citing as as part of the impetus to cut for sports. I guess I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about how universities should be handling those losses when it comes to athletics. You know, should they be supporting them or, you know, cutting programs where necessary? What do you think? Well, so uh, <laughs> I've been involved with the NCAA as a long, long time, as you know, and I currently serve on the governing board of the NCAA, which is the highest level governing board. And so I understand intimately the financial model on which uh, intercollegiate athletics uh, has been based for a long time. And the revenue sports, main revenue sports, as you know, football, men's basketball and women's basketball, and um, what those revenues bring in help fund uh, the rest of the Olympic sports uh, for both, both men and women uh, mm -hmm. on most university campuses. There are very few universities that are self-sustaining. I know, I think in Iowa, there was some legislation about uh, making intercollegiate athletics self-supporting uh, for all the, the universities. And sure. you know, this is very tough. I happen to believe that intercollegiate athletics is very beneficial. It's good for students. Uh, it is, it's good for, the cohesiveness of communities. You know, I love the Iowa Hawkeyes. I love watching them. Uh, and uh, it, it, because it, it, it's, it brings, it, it's like the family. It's the family coming together to cheer for something that we all care about. And a lot of people who never went to University of Iowa or Iowa State cheer for those teams because it's something about being part of, of something that's good. And, and, and I think that the opportunities that intercollegiate that athletics provide to young people are really tremendous. But the financial model may be broken. I know there's a lot of conversation about this now. Uh, uh, there are excessive, ex you know, particularly excessive payments to coaches. I will just say this outright. I think in the last decade, the escalation in salaries for coaches in certain fields uh, is something that we absolutely must address. We've been unable to do it because of antitrust, uh, but the NCAA is going both to the Supreme Court and to Congress uh, mm -hmm. to see if some of those issues might be changed. Uh, so I think we've sort of, our priorities have gotten skewed and we need to rethink those priorities. And we're gonna have to work on this really hard. I'm not sure, Vanessa, what all the answers are gonna be, but I certainly hope that we can maintain a broad array of sports opportunities for both men and women uh, in college, because I think that the good that they do far outweighs uh, the problems that they face. Right, right. I mean, obviously many people love sports, love the athletics, just like you do. And in most years they make a lot of money, you know, for those, uh, those enterprises. What do you think about the, the idea of athletes wanting to be paid uh, in some of the proposals around that? Sure. Uh, I've been involved in this issue for a long time and certainly with the name, image and likeness uh, legislation uh, that, that actually we're, it's one of the things we're going to the Supreme Court for the NCAA is going to the Supreme Court for. The NCAA, after a lot of careful thought has put forward a proposal for what we call NIL, it's name, image, and likeness. Um, I think there are some pathways that, that, that could be uh, productive uh, for both the students and for the institutions. Uh, a model that simply pays students for participating in sport by the universities, I think is, is very dangerous uh, and would be very damaging. Uh, can you imagine what would happen if you know three stars on your 
basketball team were paid and nobody, none of the other team members were? Do you think that would help team cohesion? Uh, what about the football team? Would you pay the quarterback and nobody else? Linemen don't get paid. I mean, when you really think about the complexities, uh, it, is, it is extremely difficult. What all institutions need to be doing though, is making sure that they're, uh, they have scholarships for their student athletes that don't end when they stop playing, that they have scholarships through uh, obtaining their career, career their degrees, uh, that they have good health insurance, good medical care. These are the th things that we need to be doing uh, to make sure that we're taking care of our intercollegiate athletes. But simply paying them to play, I think would destroy uh, what we have now, which is very special uh, intercollegiate athletics. Sure, yeah. And we're coming up to the end here, but I wanted to ask you if you have thoughts on academic medical centers, which obviously mm -hmm. Iowa and Michigan have, and the importance of um, maintaining those those institutions that are that merge both like a hospital and a university. Yeah, you know, I was so happy that both Iowa and uh, Michigan uh, own their own hospitals, uh, and that they have comprehensive medical centers. I will tell you, if there's something really wrong with me or someone in my family, I'm going to get to the dearest academic medical center because that's where you combine great research great care, great education, you know, all in one entity. It's where the cutting edge uh, happens in medicine. It's where, you know, I just talked about the scientists that were able to, uh, to create cures uh, and, and uh, in, you know, uh, vaccinations for this pandemic. Uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's something that is extremely important. And because Iowa has a big academic medical center, the researchers on the main campus benefit from that, particularly the researchers in chemistry and biology and engineering, because they can collaborate with people who are treating patients uh, and, and see the real world implication of some of the discoveries, the technology transfer, the patents. Uh, these are extremely valuable. And, uh, and, and I think it's, important that we keep those together. You know, there was a big rush back in the 1990s to help to sell university hospitals um, because everybody was afraid that they would become a financial drain on the rest of the university. I'm so happy that in both Iowa and Michigan, that decision was not made because I think it's been shown that having those uh, entities as part of the university has worked out extremely well for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think just one last question I'll ask you here is whether you have thoughts on the prospect of four-year degrees at community colleges. Obviously that's been discussed. So. Sure, I, you know, I know it has. Um, I think it would be quite expensive for the state to do that. Um, right now, I don't see the need at all because if anything, you know, Iowa has uh, you know, plenty of seats for undergraduates that are coming in from community colleges to finish their degrees. And I just don't see it as a wise investment for the state. Great, well, I just wanna thank you again so much for participating today, for answering our questions. Um, as we close this out, I wanna thank everybody for joining, for listening in. We have sessions uh, all week through Thursday. Tomorrow's uh, first session, there's two tomorrow. The first is at 11 a.m. and it's kind of a view from the top look at education in Iowa. So with like panelists like Iowa State President Wendy Winterstein, uh, President of National Center for Higher Education Management System, Sally Johnstone, who's based in Colorado, uh, and then our noon discussion will look at higher education affordability in Iowa. Um, the Gazette's full annual Iowa Ideas Conference, October 14th and 15th, again, will be virtual this year. Uh, it's going to span a range of tracks from education to environment, policy, and healthcare. It's free uh, to attend as long as you register, and that is open right now at iowaideas.com. Um, just, just to note, our keynote speakers for that main event are David Gould, who's a visiting professor at the University of Iowa's Public Policy Center, and he's just an amazing speaker and an amazing man. I'm sure many of you know him because everybody seems to. Um, and then Peggy Whitson, who, who is a retired NASA astronaut, and she's a current collaborator with SpaceX. So that should be uh, very interesting, obviously.
Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, President Coleman. We really appreciate your time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye.